The year of our Lord, 1565. Sunrise on the St. John's River. Sir John Hawkins, a privateer licensed by Queen Elizabeth with priest and crew, prayed together aboard his galleon. O oh, all ye works of the Lord, bless ye the Lord. Praise him and magnify him forever. The Daily Office from the 1559 Book of Common Prayer was prayed for the first time in Florida. A foundation for mission and a plea for vision. It wasn't until 1763 that the Anglican Church finally took hold in St. Augustine, but it lasted just 20 years. Spain was in charge of Florida for an extremely long time, from the settlement of, of St. Augustine and Ponce de Leon dis discovering Florida. However, there was a series of four wars in Europe that spilled over to the colonies, or what became the colonies. And so in between the third and the fourth war, there was a time about 20 years where the British gained control of Florida. And in that time period, the um, Anglican Church took root. However, after that 20 year period, the Spanish basically got Florida back in the loss with the British, um, with the American Revolution. And so when it reverted back to the Spanish, they only allow Roman Catholicism. During that second Spanish occupation, Florida was a haven for pirates, privateers, freebooters, lawless adventurers, slave traders, unscrupulous merchants, and Indians on the warpath. Throw in the land grabbers from Georgia, the Carolinas, and Virginia, then season it with Tories fleeing American persecution, and you know why Florida was called Satan's backyard. The Americans wanted it back. With, they were able to get the Spanish to sign the Adams Onus Treaty, and once that occurred, it became a American possession, and then the Anglican Church was, to some degree, reborn and rebuilt within the United States. The mission field was open, and in 1838, the Diocese of Florida was organized. The 15 men gathered at St. John's Episcopal Church in Tallahassee endured hardships we cannot imagine traveling for weeks through forests and swamps, on foot, horseback, and boat, from Key West to Pensacola. It wasn't until 1852 that our first bishop, Francis Rutledge, addressed the diocesan convention. When we survey the wide extent of the territory embraced within the limits of the state, a very small portion of which is as yet occupied as missionary ground, the scattered condition of the population and the difficulty of gaining access to many of the settlements, we cannot but acknowledge that exceedingly great are the obstacles to our rapid growth. With 10 parishes, eight clergy, and a bishop, the people endured the Seminole Wars, Yellow Fever, and the war between the states. Following the Civil War, as his last official act, Bishop Rutledge brought the diocese back into unity with the northern branch of the Episcopal Church. By the 1880s, northerners were moving down in huge numbers. The second bishop of Florida, John Freeman Young, saw a great mission opportunity, and dozens of carpenter Gothic churches sprang up across Florida. These were churches that were built in the late 19th century, mainly because um, rural people were um, interested in uh, churches that they could afford. And uh, as it happened just at that time, a 
famous architect in the United States, uh, Richard Upjohn, uh, had been designing uh, Gothic churches, large Gothic churches, the main one being Trinity in New York. And these rural people were so fascinated that they asked Upjohn to design um, smaller churches for them so that they could afford. Bishop Young responded to Upjohn's designs. They had the same look and feel of the great northern churches, but were built with local materials by local labor. They are the little wooden churches. The um, major characteristic are the pointed arches. Those are the telltale signs. All of them have a stained glass windows in them, and they usually are in very, very, very uh, beautiful locations. A young always thought that the surroundings of the church were just as important as the church itself. Around our church right now, there are many stained glass windows and fixtures in here with names on it of people who gave not just the money for those things, but really gave up their hearts and minds and lives to make sure that there was still a witness to Christ. As I look through um, the history, what amazes me is all the bad times that they came through. And it was the start of the Civil War. But the aftermath here was, was even worse in a way because a lot of men had gone to war and not come back or they came back wounded and couldn't work in the fields anymore. The church had to adapt through really difficult times. Just about the time that they got going again, um, World War I and World War II came along. Members of this church somehow came through and kept moving forward. These simple, quiet, wooden missions were spiritual homes for South Florida's newest residents, and they were desperately needed. In 1892, the Missionary District of South Florida was formed with five parishes, 40 organized missions, and 11 mission stations. A year later, the first convention was held at Holy Cross Episcopal Church in Sanford, Florida, the mother church of our diocese, with Bishop William Crane Gray presiding. Despite crop-destroying freezes and devastating hurricanes, plague, and disease, a war with Spain, land booms, and economic crashes, these churches continued their mission, bring the gospel to the people, even during the Great Depression. It was hard to keep them together, and uh, of course we were always broke. We never had any money. And when, um, before I was married, I belonged to the um, Young People's Service League, and I have a little article in there that was in the uh, Palm Branch that tells of what the young people did in helping keep the church up, paying for the light part of the light bill, and doing the lawn and all those kind of things. So everybody had to pitch in to keep it open. They just kept moving forward, and I just think of that, you know, it's not about this building. This building is where we worship, but we are the church. By 1922, South Florida was booming once more, and we had enough healthy congregations to become a diocese. A year later, the first diocesan convention was held at the Cathedral of St. Luke, with Bishop Cameron Mann presiding. His goal was for the Diocese of South Florida to attain independent status, which it eventually did. When Bishop Mann died in 1932, he was succeeded by Bishop John Durham Wayne, and the diocese continued to grow rapidly. Well, I th think there were a lot of reasons why that happened. You know, they were right at the end of the Depression. And Bishop Wayne, the bishop before, had been very intelligent in that, for instance, in Maitland there was a little church they really couldn't make it, but he didn't get rid of it because the, the worth of a church to sell it was almost zero. Nobody wanted to buy it. But Bishop Wing had confidence that they would be people, like, the people in Maitland would be able to go back to Maitland once the economy improved, which it eventually did. As economic recovery gained traction, populations began booming again, and new churches were needed to keep up. In the 1950s alone, 74 new congregations were planted, 25 becoming parishes by 1966. Presiding over much of this growth was Bishop Henry I. Lautet, who assumed the mantle of diocesan bishop in 1950. 
but with the exponential growth, he found it nearly impossible to visit all the churches in the diocese. He needed help. South Florida was one diocese that ranged from um, Crystal River on the west coast to Key West and from Ormond Beach on the east coast to Key West and everything in between. And Bishop Laudit used to have it pretty much by himself. As the um, state of Florida grew so fast in the, in the uh, 60s, he envisioned and a strategy of a splitting the diocese into three uh, geogra geographical areas that could serve better the church for the sake of spreading the gospel. We needed to establish new congregations. We needed to have more priests and deacons. Uh, it had to be done locally. And we had to meet the need. That's the missions aspect of it. Well, of course, Bishop Laudit had the goal for some years to actually plant a new church, one a month. But the neat thing about all of that was the diocese was really formed in risk-taking. Well, it was, a, it was exciting, but it was a little traumatic, you know. Uh, under all the, the bishops that I knew, there was such collegiality. There was so much uh, back and forth between clergy and, and, and bishops. And you didn't, you didn't have divisiveness then. We were all on the same page. And it was a wonderful time to be active in the church. We used to meet at um, Camp Wickman and the, uh, for clergy meetings. And it was impressive, the number of clergy. Camp Wingman, named for two early bishops of the diocese, Cameron Mann and John Wing, was built in 1939. There was a mess hall with kitchen, five cabins, a caretaker cottage, and a pump house. The camp was a booming success for both students and clergy for decades. But in the 1970s, interest waned, and in 1979, Camp Wingman was sold. In 1982, Canterbury Retreat and Conference Center opened, a lakeside haven with meeting rooms, dining facilities, and overnight accommodations. It's been an important resource for Christian ministries in our diocese and beyond. One of the most significant has been Curcio, one of the most effective missions of the diocese. The need to engage youth in the gospel was still there, and a new vision was needed to help young people grow in Christ. A new position was created, a canon for youth and education met with a number of adults uh, that had a vision. Um, one of them was a young priest with long hair named Greg Brewer, and uh, he was on that initial committee, and uh, he and others had a vision of uh, building relationships with young people and helping them grow in Christ. One of the events that we did in the diocese, that was an event where we gathered many young people, six, seven, eight hundred young people from around the diocese, for a day-long celebration. The seeds planted in those days have certainly borne fruit. Among those student leaders, Scott Slater is the canon of the ordinary in the Diocese of Maryland. Ann Vickers is the chief financial officer in the Diocese of Southwest Florida. And Dan Hazeltine is lead singer and a founding member of the highly successful Christian band, Jars of Clay. By the 1990s, the new owners of old Camp Wingman fell on hard times. The buildings were abandoned and in poor condition. But a handful of former campers from the 1960s had a vision. Restore the camp to its glory and its original purpose. After years of restoration and improvement, Camp Wingman is a year-round retreat center and a first-rate summer camp for teens. It allows them to be more receptive because they're away from everything, you know, and they hear it. And all of a sudden you just see a completely different person who was a troublemaker when he first came, and then he's like an angel when he leaves. And it was just, I'm, it's kind of breathtaking, actually. I have seen kids at the very first day of camp, you can look at their eyes, and you can see pain in their eyes. And after, at the end of the week, oftentimes that pain is gone and that's just a happy-go-lucky kid. And if that's all they got out of camp with that week was just being able to dump some of that pain that they brought with it, that's, that's wonderful. I couldn't ask for anything more. It's 
a place to come on with God because he's the true maker and he's the one who's made us. Children are the future of the church, and getting them a Christian education is more important and more challenging than ever. But the Episcopal Church in Central Florida has been a haven of high quality learning and Christian formation, a key mission for present and future generations. Every child that comes here is a child of God, and to be able to minister to them uh, during their hard times and their wonderful times. It has been a real blessing for, for all of us who are involved in school ministry. When I came to St. Andrews, uh, it, they were very clear that the school was our major outreach and uh, a, a real center of what my job would be. So what we're able to do is say, our Episcopal identity is our number one reason for being who we are. That, that's our school. In Vero Beach, Trinity Episcopal Church is rebuilding a relationship with St. Edward's School and strengthening Christian formation for those students. It really represents uh, an outreach program for us because there are 500 kids a week at that school that are getting time with a clergyman and they're hearing the gospel preached. I think it does start with the leadership, the interest of uh, each of the rectors we've had into the school. Um, either their own personal interest or their own children attending. That creates a very strong bond. When you're dealing with young people, um, you have to wait sometimes for years to see how they mature and grow. And one of my greatest blessings is seeing children come back as adults and be baptized and embrace the faith. That's, that's really what it's all about. In the late 1960s, a movement to elevate deacons sprang up. A new two-year program was proposed, the Institute for Christian Studies. They prayed for 10 registrations. In the fall of 1973, the school opened at All Saints Episcopal Church in Winter Park with 92 students and extraordinary faculty, a tradition which continues today. At the beginning of the 20th century, there was an even greater need for learning. Segregation prevented African Americans from even the most basic education. Something needed to be done, and St. John the Baptist Episcopal Church was ready to help. Our church became the first, uh, had the first parochial school for people of color in Orange County. Some of the members of our church attended that school in the early years. I think education is one of the keys towards good understanding. If we can decide where we came from, then we'll know where we're going. If by chance that every child has a chance to learn the history of each other, Americans learn about Germans, Germans learn about West Indians, South Americans. So we have an understanding, that educational piece. It'll go back to creation that says God created everyone in his image. The community needed more than just educational outreach, and they found hope at St. John the Baptist. When we were a mission, our church housed the first library for people of color. When I was a girl, that's where the library was. It was in the uh, vicarage. When the priests came, they lived on second floor. The public library was on the first floor. In the racially charged 1960s, the need for reconciliation was critical. The diocese responded with the Awareness Center. Well, the Awareness Center was a place for reconciliation and discussion between blacks and whites working together, trying to bring harmony. It was an experimental ministry that was trying to pave the way in Central Florida to get people to begin to talk to each other and work with each other, building racial understanding through peace and order. 
The signs that dot our cities and towns read, the Episcopal Church welcomes you. And as Central Florida's population grew more diverse, we responded. We had people from as far as Asia, Africa, England, South America, Central America, the West Indies, Canada, and the USA, of course. And everybody comes together here to celebrate Jesus Christ, our common denominator. Diversity in the, in the Spanish congregation, also some Anglo people, but most uh, Mexican, Dominican, Republican, Dominican, Puerto Rican people, Colombian, Spain, uh, Nicaragua, uh, El Salvador, uh, uh, etc. Building understanding is not limited to our neighborhoods. Reaching beyond our borders is an integral part of our mission, particularly in Central America. In the early 1970s, the Episcopal Church in Honduras was struggling. There were just four congregations and three priests. Was it worth saving? Bishop Falwell and other leaders thought it was. And at General Convention in 1973, a companion relationship was established, which continues today the longest running companion relationship in the Episcopal Church. And one of the first things I did after becoming bishop, coadjutor, was to travel to Honduras to experience it for myself. And I was immediately taken with the vitality of the church there. It was, I'm not sure it's still true, but it was then the fastest growing diocese in the Anglican Communion. Bishop Leo Friday, he was at the time the Bishop of Honduras. And he came here and uh, asked if uh, the couple of members of the vestry would return to Honduras with him because he wanted to show them where we were going to build a church. But building the church was just the beginning. There was also a desperate need for health care. An appeal was made to local doctors, but with our medical credentials, doors kept closing. So finally I got down on my knees and prayed about it one day. Uh, that I wasn't really in the habit of doing. And I, I uh, it was kind of a first time doing something like that. And so I told God, I said, I've tried everything in my own power and I haven't been able to come up with it. So I was gonna make one more phone call. And so I got up and made this last phone call to a Dr. Gene Lee. Somebody said he would do a mission and I got a hold of his wife answered the phone. And I said, is Dr. Lee there? And she said, no, he's not here right now he's out of the country. And I said, oh no. And she said, what's the matter? Are you sick? She thought I was a patient. I said, no, I'm wanting to do a medical mission in Honduras and he's my last call. And she said, well, I'm a housewife and if I can do it, you can too. And I've been running a mission for 11 years. With her guidance and a lot more prayer, the pieces began to fall in place. 19 doctors, nurses, and other volunteers made that first trip. After that, medical mission teams grew, treating nearly 3,000 patients on a five-day trip. They say, well, I spent all my money, and I took this whole week off, I didn't get paid, I worked like I never worked before, but yet it feels so good and, you know, and enjoy it. And um, I just tell them because you're doing what you were created to do. And uh, in the eye section, I'll, I'll, I'll see sometimes over 400 patients in four days, which is a lot of patients, uh, but I've got you know, wonderful people working with us uh, to get these folks taken care of, and we deliver a lot of care. Whether we are working in New Orleans with a, an Episcopal relief agency, cleaning out somebody's house that was flooded after Katrina, and meeting those people, whether we are working with the homeless and feeding them out of a food truck in the middle of Manhattan, or whether we are playing with children at St. Albans Child Enrichment Center in Miami, um, or whether we're in Haiti with our partner school and meeting those children. Um, we are learning to see God in all kinds of ways. Our call to mission, take the gospel to everyone, includes older Americans. One of the earliest efforts in the diocese was the Bishop Gray Inn, a home for the elderly in Davenport, Florida. Although it was sold, the proceeds of the sale seeded the Bishop Gray Retirement Foundation. Their mission is to provide financial assistance for reasonable housing and health care to elderly Episcopalians 
from the southeast, southwest, and central Florida. A decade later, local churches began providing affordable living space for older residents. Holy Trinity Episcopal Church in Melbourne and St. Mary's Episcopal Church in Daytona Beach built large-scale high-rise facilities that responded to an urgent missional need. Father Knox Brundy was our rector during that early 60s, and it was his vision to provide a living facility for people 62 and over who were of low income. Back in 1967, when Bishop Loudard came over here and they had the dedication, and during the dedication ceremony, his comment was he was delighted that we had not named it Loud at Memorial Manor instead of Loud at Manor, which apparently drew a big laugh at that time. <laughs> One of the fastest growing cities in Florida is directly related to the growth of our senior population. It's called the Villages, and it's home to more than 50,000 older residents. Well, we started with about 80 people as a mission. Uh, we met in several different rooms here at the Villages, and uh, in 14 months, we went from mission to parish. It was the most exciting time of my life. I think uh, my wife told me I spent more time here than I did at home. Oh, prayer was a large part in it. My own personal faith has uh, blossomed in this church. Sometimes planting churches required a bit more creativity. In 1959, Holy Apostles Episcopal Church had a rather unconventional beginning. We had moved from Virginia and were coming down that day into Florida. And we got on the O'Galley Causeway and was stuck there. And we were about four cars back from the opening. And my mother finally decides, I'm going to get out and see what's going on. So she comes back and she says, there's a church on a barge and it's going to come through this bridge. And we said, sure. I, I was with my father. We came down here to the church to see it um, put on the barge. And then what they did is they took down the seawall. They, they put the church on rollers and actually rolled the church out onto the barge and secured it onto the barge. And then it started its journey up north on the Indian River. That was really a sight to watch. The members of St. Andrews did not want their historic building to become a museum, so they gave it away and gave a new congregation old roots. I was in Fort Pierce, and the ladies were getting ready for a luncheon, and they said, have you ever seen our scrapbook from July 1959? And I said, no, I'd really be interested in that. And they said, yeah, it details how the church, how we put our church over the seawall and put it on a barge and the tide had gone out, so we had to wait till the next day. <laughs> and uh, and in, in fact, it was that church. And I had seen it 29 years before and had never made the connection. I mean, it's amazing how God kind of weaves in and out of our lives that way. All life is woven together by God. When these threads come together, we see God's mission before us, especially when the foundation of our call is prayer. I honestly think Without prayer, you don't have any real significant relationship with God, period. Uh, you can't be married and never talk to your wife and have a, a, a relationship. Some have tried, <laughs> but it doesn't work. So I think prayer is very, I think it's essential. I think prayer undergirds everything. Um, you have not because you ask not. And uh, we've seen some wonderful things. Um, I hoped that by the time of my retirement, we would have a hundred congregations. And then we ran into the buzzsaw of disaffiliation. One of the largest churches in the diocese, Trinity Church in Vero Beach, was deeply affected by division and departure. There is a retired priest who winters with us, and he said, everything this church needs to survive is here. We only need pray and follow what we're led to do, and everyone will give of their talents, and the church will grow. And everybody came forward and did their part. We volunteered 
in the office, we volunteered on the grounds, wherever it was needed. People stayed together and uh, we were just going to make this work. I think it took faith primarily and our love for Christ and knowing that standing strong and doing what we believed in and following the gospel was what guided us through the whole process. I've felt from the very beginning of our problems that God looked down and said, there's some really good people here, let's stir the pot and save them. And he's done nothing but help us through everything we've done. And we're very grateful. If you look through some of the old diaries of Bishop's long past and some of the great humorous stories that they tell about, you know, going down the river and all this sort of stuff and going to congregations on a Sunday morning, you'll see that these people were people of prayer, uh, really almost beyond um, belief in terms of, of what they really felt that undergirded their entire ministry and their entire lives. First job is trying to awaken people to the fact that, hey, there is something better, and why are we not participating in it? And that's, that to me is part of what the mission of the church is. For those shipboard prayers in 1565, for those early settlers who survived natural disasters and violent human conflicts, for those who weathered economic and social storms, for those who flourished and those who suffered, for their willingness, their tenacity, and their prayerful obedience to the one true God, we remember for the sake of our future. King of